Welcome to a really exciting chat today with Romani. Let me first introduce her, even though it, I'm for sure not going to do justice uh, with all of her accomplishments, but just a brief background. Romani is a very accomplished senior biopharma executive and entrepreneur with over 25 years of biopharma industry experience. She is a managing director of Revive Advisors and was also co-founder and until recently president and CEO of Xbiotics, a biopharma company focused on novel antibiotics. She has also held senior positions in research and business and corporate development, including at Merck, Millennium, Momenta, Archemix, and she was a co-founder and chief business officer at Checkmate Pharmaceuticals. I'm especially excited since uh, Romani and I are um, bio, uh, Women in Bio's boardroom ready uh, colleagues. And uh, I was even at the time when we were together in the class, very struck by all the insights she was sharing with us, how transparent she was about uh, sharing her life stories, the obstacles, but also achievements uh, that she was facing. And I really look forward to um, sharing all of this with you today. And uh, yeah, let me, let me start with uh, the first question and uh, please also ask questions uh, in the meantime. Uh, Ramani, what would you say was the most difficult thing that you found uh, about being a CEO? Yeah, no, let me, let me, um, I'll get to that. But uh, um, in a second, Stephanie, of course, you'd started off with the toughest question, but I like that. Um, so first of all, I want to thank Laura and uh, the Boost organization for inviting me um, here. And thanks, Stephanie. Nice to see you again um, for coordinating this, this event here today. Uh, lots of familiar faces in the chat or in the in the screen here, which is really nice. Um, so again, as, as everyone said, let's keep this low key and um, you know interactive. And I'm happy to do do my best in addressing questions. I will say, just as you know, at the get go to start us off, this is a journey for all of us. And and although I appreciate the great words that Laura and Stephanie said as an introduction to me, I'm still on the journey, much like all of you. So that's just something I want to put up front. Is I. I I don't feel I've ever kind of come to the end of it until, you know, I'm no longer, I no longer have a pulse, I guess. Uh, but as of now, you know, I'm still on the journey. And so with that said, let me tackle the first question you, you posed to me, Stephanie, which I think kind of goes to the crux of a lot of, a lot of what we do, you know, um, in terms of, we always like to know what the challenges are, because as I think mostly type A people here, we like to uh, hit challenges head on and more importantly, try to overcome them. So what was the most difficult thing I found out, found about being a CEO? Um, I'll say a couple things. One is the need and probably more importantly, the desire. So sort of a self-inflicted thing to be on all the time, no respite. And so there's lessons learned from this and I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but the need to just always feel like I had to have all the answers to everything all the time. Because at the end of the day, as the CEO, you are the chief executive, you need to, you are in, in, in front of the board, you're in front of the shareholders, you're in front of the employees, you're in front of the investors, and you're kind of that, that turnstile through which everything passes, information and otherwise. And I really it took that uh, role very seriously. Um, and, you know, I would, I expect that any CEO that takes on that role would take that role very seriously. But the a difficult thing for me was really to, to sort of be on all the time, um, especially because the company that I founded and was running was effectively kind of in the startup phase. And we ended up growing quite a bit when I was there, when I was running it, but just the need to sort of feel like I, um, I had to have all the answers, which of course we never do. I learned that, you know, very quickly. Um, and then knowing more importantly, when not to get into the details and staying at a high level. And so as an example, I'll give you here, um, I didn't have a full-time CFO. A lot of these smaller companies, even frankly, at the point where they're going public, they're, they're just about to think about getting a, a full-time CFO, which is surprising in, in, in many ways. But I felt I needed to know the numbers inside out. And, and I did but I didn't need to have to get up in front of the board and present every single gory detail of the numbers. And I, I memorized everything and I just knew everything so well that 
I was ready and prepared to do that in front of the board, to present all the details in front of the board. But then I realized that, well, I'm the one running the show, so to speak. I have experts that I can turn to and that I can leverage. That's why I hired them. That's why they are where they are. I'm not the CSO because that's not my forte. I'm not the CFO because that's not my forte. I can certainly speak the speak and dance the dance if I needed to. But that was the other big thing. Uh, It was a big challenge for me to just really understand that I didn't have to have all the answers and I didn't have to really present everything all the time and really leveraging and networking with my colleagues and giving them the opportunity, more importantly, to get up in front of the various audiences and present. Um, I can keep going on, but um, the other thing I will say is part of being a CEO, and this was something I found challenging in the beginning, but you kind of jump right into it and learn as you go is the storytelling piece. We're all in our roles, whatever role you are, whether you're a CSO or a CBO or a scientist, you, there's always some storytelling involved in your role, whether it be uh, talking about what you do to audiences or to your colleagues or talking about uh, who you are as a person. And so learning how to pivot the story to accommodate the different audiences we were presenting to was something that was challenging for me in the beginning. Uh, but with my BD background, I learned and I kind of had the the wherewithal to, to pivot very quickly. But I will say, just going back to my earlier comment, Stephanie, that really just understanding that I didn't have to always be on and that I had, I had colleagues um, to, to, to rely on and to network with and to sort of step in uh, to, to play their role because I was giving them the opportunity to do what they do best. Took me, uh, it didn't take me long to figure it out because when you're a CEO, I, I would argue that there are, it's very limited degrees of freedom. Uh, you, you either are successful or you very learn, you learn very quickly, you fail very quickly, and then you learn how not to do that mistake again. And so, um, yeah, that, that's what I would say is just uh, what I said earlier about learning the, uh, the, the need to, that I didn't need to be on all the time. That's certainly very insightful. It also speaks very much to you also as a leader that you let others in your organization shine and also give them the limelight uh, at, at a board meeting by drawing on their expertise. So that's definitely a great segue to uh, the next question. Um, I'm sure everybody here is very interested also about your fundraising experience and especially uh, the early stages are really hard. Um, maybe you can give us some advice uh, on the success in the earliest rounds, the seed round, the series A financing process. Yeah, no, absolutely. So as you all know, uh, one of the biggest roles a CEO has is to fundraise. And I, I see some of you here who've been CEOs or, and maybe who even are CEOs. Um, fundraising is a group effort, frankly. No one can do it them on, no, no one can do it on their own. Uh, but at the end of the day, the CEO does have to stand up in front of a group of people, men and women, um, and a broad and, and diverse audience and pitch. And so um, how do you access this, you know, this early stage funding? What are the challenges associated with? First is, first off, know your story, right? I mean, you, you would never go talk to an audience on the BD side or you would never, as a scientist, disclose data or talk about data if you didn't really didn't understand what the data was saying. You wouldn't go randomly throw numbers out there and throw hypotheses out there. So, you know, knowing your story, um, but doing your homework in terms of understanding where your company and your company's story fits in the broader context of the industry and other competitive avenues or competitive technologies or products that there might be in the industry. The last thing an investor wants to hear is some sort of soapbox, you know, soapbox pitch where you're up on a on a soapbox and you're sort of, um, you know, sort of streaming the 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 advantages of your approach while not understanding where you as an organization fit within the broader context of the industry. And so, you know, know your story, do your homework with respect to that story. Um, I would also say when you're pitching, know your strengths. Um, and if you know as a, as a storyteller that you're not hot on the science, you're not, well, maybe hot's the wrong word, you are hot. If you're a CEO, you're definitely hot on everything. But if you're not the expert in telling the story and you would rather pass that on to the CSO, there's no problem in bringing that CSO or that expert to the pitch. And so the last thing, again, an investor wants to do is to listen to someone speak uh, to listen to someone who doesn't know the story well enough to speak to the story. 
And so I would say, again, know what your strengths are, know where your weaknesses are and fill in that gap with the weaknesses. There's nothing wrong as a CEO, as the, the lead pitcher, so to speak, to bring um, your, your co-pitchers or your co-batsmen or batswomen to the, to, I mean, it's a team effort at the end of the day. Um, I would also say one of the things I, you know, I've, I've advised others on and I've advised myself on is lean in as lean as, and we've heard that term so often that I'm kind of tired of hearing it and saying it, but it's so apropos here. Um, don't step away, right? Know your power, know what your strengths are. And if you know what your strengths are, you clearly know where your weaknesses are because those are not your strengths. Um, and so lean in, lean into what you know well. And, um, you know, really don't sell yourself short. You've gotten to this place because of a reason. And we'll talk maybe in a little later, Stephanie, about the notion of support systems and sponsors and mentors and allies, et cetera. You are where you are because you've earned it, right? And if an investor poo-poos you or shoes you away, they weren't the right investor. They weren't meant to be. That was not the investor that was going to be um, investing in you, uh, or nor should they be. Um, you know, you're, you're, I, the other thing I would just say is you're, there are lots of, lots of pitch, lots of, um, sorry, entrepreneurs, lots of people pitching to investors. So figure out a way very quickly to be different, to differentiate yourself. And you differentiate yourself by showing up, pitching, pitching confidently, and getting the job done. And I remember, you know, leveraging networks. I mean, this is the one thing as a theme that has percolated throughout my career is networks, networks, networks. And, you know, in some ways early on in my career, I didn't really understand what that meant. You know, okay, I know people, but what does that mean? How can they help me? But this is where I would reach out to people I knew in the industry who were connected in some way, shape or form, typically through LinkedIn, um, with the investors I was going to be pitching to. And I would talk to them about those investors. I would do my homework and learn about who they were, what they liked, what they didn't like, sometimes even personally what they were like as people, you know, um, off camera, so to speak, not at the workplace, what were their hobbies? I mean, you got to figure out a way to find that common denominator with people. And this goes, this, this rings true with respect to just relating to people in life. This is being a human, right? It's about just finding out what the commonalities are between each of us. So why wouldn't we bring that ex expertise to the, 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 the pitch floor, so to speak? Um, the other thing I would just say is on the pitching side, as a woman, I know this comes up a lot, and I think that was partly what the question was, was leaning towards, uh, Stephanie. As a woman, it is, it is more difficult to pitch, period. I mean, any woman who says it isn't, Either they've just had the red carpet rolled out in front of them, or they've had so many people who've literally opened doors, which I know many of many of us don't have or haven't had, um, and hopefully will have because you know we'll all be allies for each other. But at the end of the day, um, as a woman, you are you are expected to know more and pitch more and just be that much more solid than your male counterpart. It is what it is, and the sooner we just acknowledge it, as opposed to fighting it. And putting it on the side and then moving forward, the better off we'll be. And so that's one thing I kept in mind. I never used the fact that I was a woman, and in this case, a woman of color as a crutch. Rather, I just said, you know, it is what it is, and I'm just going to put my best foot forward. And if they say no, I'm not going to take no for an answer. No probably just means not now. So I would keep that in mind. And then I would come back when I had more of a story and when I had hit a milestone or when we had some press release that we wanted to talk about. And I'd go back to them and I'd say, look at what else I've done since we last spoke. And so that no, whereas we could all take it very personally, and I certainly did in my early days, it really, to me, in my mind, meant not right now, come back. Um, and so that's something that just, I, you know, I really encouraged myself to keep in mind. And I would encourage anyone who's on the, on the, um, on the uh, on the soapbox, so to speak, or on the pitching front, to to keep in mind also. Um, the the other thing is, be aware of biases. There are always going to be unconscious biases and microaggressions. As long as you're aware, you'll know how to deal with them. It's almost the notion of you know the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. So when a micro when you encounter a microaggression or some sort of pushback that was untoward or or just unexpected, you're not reacting and you're just like okay it is what it is again. I'm going to continue down my path and pitch. And so knowing your story, um, knowing who you're pitching to, 
understanding that biases exist and using that sort of as a guidepost, but not really hitching yourself to that. I, I think really we're, we're sort of in, you know, in combination, a mechanism by which I kind of was, was successful in raising our round of financing. I, I will also say, um, you know, continue to leverage your networks. And, and this is something that I am still learning how, how to do, even after my 25 years of being in the industry, first as a scientist, and then as a corporate development executive and a CEO and advisor board, et cetera, I'm still learning how to reach out to people, not be shy, not think I'm over asking, because again, the worst thing someone could say is no. And typically no means not now, right? When you kind of change that that perspective, it, it opens up so many, you know, it opens up so much in, in the way of a path forward. And finally, I, I will say that when it comes to women pitching versus men pitching, um, I often found that the questions that I was asked by investors and all well-intentioned investors, no one had a bad bone in their body. No one was ill-intentioned, but I will say they were biased in their questioning. And typically the questions I got were things that were associated with risk mitigation. Now, how are you going to handle a situation if you don't do this, or if the science doesn't pan out, how are you gonna manage that? Versus I would talk to my male counterparts who were fundraising and they would tell me about how the investors would ask them about what opportunities they saw. Where was the company going to grow? How are you going to advance science? How are you going to build the business? You know, what patient population were you serving? So again, be aware. And the more you're aware, the more you're prepared, and the more you avoid these sort of, you know, surprise looks or surprise knee-jerk reactions in, in front of these investors. So sorry, long-winded answer, Stephanie. And I can keep talking about it because I, I think none of us ever really you know, have the full answer to how best to pitch. But I think knowing knowing your game and knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know gets you really far. Well, this is this is a wonderful answer. And of course, uh, continue if you have more insights for us. Is there a question from somebody? Uh, there is actually one uh, on the chat from Padma. Thank you for sharing this. Um, it goes back a little bit uh, to your... Um, so you move from being a BD leader to uh, a CEO. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I'll come back a little bit to pitching because I will share a story that that's kind of uh, you know chuckle in, inducing. Um, why did I move from be, being a BD? Okay, so it, there always there comes a point in each of our lives, I think, where we feel like we've sort of done everything we think we can do. Right. You know, I've done this. I've done that. I've, I've touched all four corners of the square and every other aspect of the perimeter. And I don't feel I'm learning. I don't feel I'm I'm really leveraging my strengths and frankly, going into the unknown. And the other thing I like to do is um, I kind of operate in this is my mantra for life in general is operate from a space of comfort, but reach for discomfort. And so if all I'm living in is in a space of comfort, then I just don't feel I'm challenged. Um, and so that's partly why I just decided I wanted to do something different. Uh, I wanted to just take all my learnings as a scientist and as a BD expert and um, uh, having worked in big and small companies and you know pitched to boards and investors, et cetera. And I wanted to actually see what it would be like to take the reins. I had no clue as to what that meant. All I knew is that it was something that I had a desire to do. I felt I had the wherewithal. Um, I had checked enough boxes of my own boxes, by the way, and we can talk about others' boxes versus your own boxes. But I checked enough of my own boxes to say, why not go do it? And the small story associated with this is, as I was thinking about founding Xbiotics and um, I sort of network with people and we talked about, let's kind of maybe have me come on and, and make this happen. But before I agreed to doing this, I wasn't really sure if I was cut out for it. You know, I had this, oh my goodness, you know, can you believe it? This imposter syndrome moment where I thought I can't do this. I mean, how am I going to be a CEO and raise money and hire a team of people and run a company? I never really thought, what do I know about doing that? But I think that was the underlying feeling. And I had a conversation with, with my family about it. And um, I remember my husband said to me, he goes, you know, look, all that is, is well and good, but you never want to look in the future. You, want, you never want to be in the future and looking back and say, what if, right? What if I had done it? 
And so I said, okay, that's it. That, that, that's what really kind of turned my perspective on it. Cause I never wanted to live my life and then look 10 years, 10 years behind and say, oh, what if only I had done that? You know, cause I would have never known. So I said, I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to jump into the deep end and take that chance. And I did it. And I realized that frankly, everyone is in the same boat, right? We all think the grass is greener and th that person knows what they're doing, but frankly, none of us do. We're all helping each other and learning as we go. And some are more experienced and some are less. That's why I say we're all on a journey. And so that's why Padma, I, I decided to make that shift. And I'm really happy I did. I, I learned a ton, a ton. And I have no regrets with where the company ended up and with where I am. And I know that at some point in time, I will likely want to do that again. So hopefully that's helpful. I, I see Katie, do you have uh, yeah, your hand Katie? up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, uh, Katie McCabe from Ar Arbor Bio. So I had a question that kind of goes to what you said in the beginning and then what you were talking about the pitch and see if we could connect them piece. The, the part that I was really interested in is the idea that uh, utilizing the people who are on your team that are your experts to multiply their talents and then also be able to not feel like you have to say and represent every piece. How do you balance that with your board meetings as well as your pitching so that you are clearly a team leader, but that you're also not, uh, you know, that you're not just like sort of a figurehead that does nothing. So how do you balance that with all the biases out there? Yeah, I'm, I'm just not the bobblehead. Right. Um, no, I, you know, I, great question. I think it comes back to what I said earlier, which is know your stuff. I mean, it, it, having experts around you doesn't take away the obligation you have as a CEO to still become the expert, if you will, right? Know enough to be dangerous. And so I always tell people, I play a CMO on TV. You know, I play a CSO on TV. I play a lawyer on TV and I do. But when it comes down to excess detail, I'm happy to share the stage, if you will, with my counsel or with my CMO or my CSO, as the case may be. So you, you've got to still do your homework. You still have to sit down and pour through the details and understand exactly what's in the financial documents and understand, you know, what the bottom line is and what your budgets are looking like and what your runway is. I mean, if someone asks you at the investor pitch, what's your runway, you can't turn to your CFO and say, can you tell us what the runway is? You need to know that answer, but you don't really need to have, I mean, you certainly can if you, you want to, and I certainly enjoyed pouring through the, the financial documents, but that, that's what I mean by, you know, know what you know, and you got to know a lot, but know when it's time to also hand the baton off to someone who is the expert, because when you're in diligence, when we need, when investors are doing diligence on you and the company, you're not going to be the front person. I mean, you'll be the front person, but you certainly won't be answering every detailed question about the financials or about the clinical plan or about the science plan, but you do need to know enough to be dangerous. And, and the question about boardroom and representation, um, sort of presentation at the board level is what I would do, and I know a lot of colleagues do this as well, um, and I think it's becoming more commonplace, is um, I, would, I would run a board meeting where I would be the front presenter and I would sort of highlight what's coming down the pike vis-a-vis -vis the agenda, but I'd have my management team, my executive team in the room with me, and I would have my CSO present the science slides. I would have my CMO present the clinical slides. Similarly, the CFO present the, the, the financial slides, but I would have a slide up front before any of them got up to present to give the board an overview of what they'd be hearing. So to give them the punch points, if you will. And then I'd hand the details off to the experts and then they would leave the room once their presentations were done. And then I had the board meeting, you know, the board and me would continue the board meeting. So it allowed them an opportunity to get involved and to be right in front of the board and to participate and answer questions directly. I mean, you, you want to be transparent with them. You don't want them to hide behind a black curtain and not have visibility with the board or even have access to the board. But at the same time, there is a certain relationship the CE that the CEO has with the board of directors. And you have, to, you have to be true to yourself and to the board and maintain that relationship. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. You touched also on a on a really uh, yeah, but before that, uh, Michelle also raised her hand. Michelle Lu. Thank you so much uh, for, for sharing. So uh, I have a question is that uh, you took a different role uh, through your career. When did you know that you were ready to take on CEO role? And what do you uh, tell other women that uh, when do you feel like you are ready? I know like the ready probably is, um, is a word of 
no one knows every answers, but when do you know you're ready to take on the role? Thank you. Okay, the, the simple way to address that is, some, is sort of along the lines of what I mentioned earlier to Padma Michelle, and that is um, when you start thinking, and I think this is true of anything in life, when you start thinking enough about something other than what you're doing, that I think gives you pause, right? It, it, it's sort of an indicator for you to pause and say, well, wait, why are my thoughts going there constantly instead of just focused on what I'm doing? And so that's what I started to do. I started to get too comfortable in my role. Uh, I certainly could have continued for years and, you know, continued to, to lot, do lots more deals, but I had done enough of them. And I, I was really, you know, um, fortunate to be part of all the excitement of doing the deal, closing the deal, signing the deal, having the, the uh, celebratory dinner, et cetera, you know, making the little tchotchkes. It was all really fun and good, but I wanted to do something that was bigger, broader. And frankly, if I had to put it in philosophical terms, bigger than myself, and I just felt that where I was vis-a-vis -vis BD wasn't getting me there. Who knows? I may go back to a BD role. Who knows what the future holds for any of us, right? It might be in a different industry altogether. Um, I just read a great book uh, where, you know, this woman sort of rose to the CEO position. She had no clue she was going there, but she landed there and she scratched her head and said, let me figure it out. Uh, but she was a BD person, salesperson. So who knows where we'll go. But for me, it was the fact that I was getting too comfortable. And I really like to, the, the equation I use for myself is 50% comfortable and 50% uncharted territory, 50, un uncomfortable. And I was too comfortable. That that equation was was erring on the side of being overly comfortable. And I wasn't being challenged. I would get up in the morning and I didn't have this sort of flutter in my heart that was like, oh my God, what's the day going to hold? Because I knew exactly what my day was going to look like every day. Even in the BD world where things can get really exciting and different, it was, it was quite prescribed for me. And I wanted to just... Um, I wanted to be jumping in the deep end every day, which I certainly did in the CEO role. In this context, so you can talk a little bit more about uh, one aspect that you mentioned. You were checking your own boxes, but you felt like there are others are checking different boxes. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, no, absolutely, Stephanie. So um, in our industry, we define success, I think there's a very prescribed definition of success. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, and whether you like it or not, you've got to sit, you know, and, and that results in certain boxes, the requirement for certain boxes to be checked. So for instance, if you are a chief scientific officer, or if you're in the science realm, you've got to do A, B, and C in order for you to be deemed or seen as a successful scientist. If you are a BD person, you need to do A, B, and C in order for you to be um, seen as a successful BD person, similar in the CEO role. So I had those boxes in front of me that I needed to check, you know, raise the money, check the box, um, you know, build the team, check the box, have the story, check the box, et cetera, et cetera. But I found that sometimes as I was talking to investors or just telling the story, I was, I was narrating, narrating it in a way where I was, we as a company were steering away from what we were as a value base. And I was not box checking for myself, but rather I was doing an external box checking exercise because I felt that the investors, whatever group of investors I was talking to, wanted to hear something. And I felt I had to sort of pivot the story to accommodate what I felt or what I heard or what I was told they needed to hear. But it made us stray so far from who we were as a company in terms of our values that it was almost not worth the exercise. And so what I realized very quickly is understand what boxes you want to check for yourself. Like why, and you know, I'm sure many of you listen to podcasts a lot. I mean, certainly year of COVID was the year of podcasts for me. And Simon Sinek is, is a gentleman I listen to a lot. And he asks, you know, what's your why? And when someone says to me, like, I want to be a CEO, the first question is why, you know, and what are you trying to accomplish? What boxes are you trying to check for yourself or for the company or for, you know, the, the team as a whole? And if those boxes don't align with 
who you are as an individual and what the company is in terms of values, then you're checking the wrong box. So I, it's just one of those gut checks. It's just one of those exercises I think we all need to go through. And I certainly do that on a regular basis when I'm doing something or when I'm engaging in an exercise or an initiative. I ask myself, why am I doing it? And there are certain boxes I, I feel I need to check. And those are my boxes. Those are not the industry boxes. While at the same time, it's not to say that you only check your boxes and don't care about what industry boxes need to be checked, right? If, if, you know, if the industry says, look, to be a CEO, you need to have a certain level of experience. Well, you got to check that box before you decide you can be a CEO or before an investor is going to say, we put money in you as a CEO. Um, similarly, if you're a BD person and you want to um, get a promotion, as an example, maybe a criteria, a box checking exercise is, well, you got to do a certain number of deals or a certain size of deals, and you just have to do it. So you just have to check that box, but don't lose yourself in terms of who you are, um, uh, in terms of what values you hold that is. And so that's what I mean by that internal box checking versus external box checking. An example would be also um, a lot of women I talk to say, I want to be on a board, right? Stephanie, you and I, we talked about this a lot, right? We were at the board the boardroom program where we, we all talked about this a lot. And the question often is, why? And if the answer is, well, I don't know, or because that's what everyone else is doing. Well, you're checking not your box, but you're checking somebody else's box. So it's just, it's just one of those, those gut checks that you have to do for yourself. It's like, why am I doing something that's, if it's really to satisfy a desire I have and it fits my values, then yes, go do it. But if it's to check an external box, you're never gonna, you're not gonna be happy because you're gonna be so busy checking the industries and somebody else, someone else's boxes that you're gonna forget about who you are as an individual and what you really desire. That's a, that's a wonderful follow-up also uh, as a segue to some of the questions that uh, are in the chat. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how it, you how you were building your board, uh, how you got started, um, uh, why you did what you do, and also a little bit about some difficult uh, board moments and how you were navigating these situations? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, building the board, I don't think it's ever easy, and I will say, um, typically, startup companies, investor-backed companies, the board uh, is comprised of investors, right? And that's a good thing uh, because they put the money in, they've got views on how the money should be spent, but there's also a flip side to that, an alternative view, which is their interests are aligned with, their interests are, are aligned with with sort of what, you know, where, where the money goes and how it's used. It may not, they may not necessarily be aligned with ultimately what the success success of the company ends up being. And so I was guided early on to get independence on the board. The challenge with getting independence is, um, you know, you go through the gap analysis and to address the question on how do you build a board, you, you know, process wise, you go through sort of a gap analysis. If you're Excel oriented, like I am, you know, or analytical, like I think most of us might be, you kind of, you know, say I have uh, the clinical expertise in house. I've got, um, you know, the science expertise, I've got the financial, I really need development or I really need manufacturing. And so you identify where the gaps are. And if you can fill them with advisors, Great, go and do that. If you really feel you want to give up or allocate a board seat to an individual who brings both strategy as well as tactical experience and expertise, then do that as well. So that's essentially what we did is we went through a gap analysis and, um, you know, I identified certain gaps. And I will say um, this is actually a topic that came up in our boardroom session. Um, Stephanie was there. You know, I was really challenged with finding, so being in the antibiotic space, you needed to have a really good story storyline. It's a very tough space to raise financing in. Many companies are really kind of withering on the vine. And it's really unfortunate because we're living in a pandemic, a viral pandemic, bacterial pandemic is, is just around the corner and we're not prepared for it. You know, if, if we learn nothing from the COVID pandemic, or if we learn one thing, I should say it's let's be prepared. And unfortunately, because of commercial challenges and reimbursement challenges, the antibiotic space is just, it's, it's kind of fluttering, it's withering. 
And so I really needed to get an expert in antibiotics who at least someone who had kind of a broad brush appreciation for the space to to convince my investors and current and future investors that we really had a stronghold in the space. And I was challenged with finding a woman to fill that role. And I, you know, it's like I I kind of kicked myself in saying that, but that, that was the reality. And I had identified one individual in particular who I really wanted on the board, partly because well, mostly because he he's so well regarded and brings so much expertise and strategy perspectives to the table, but also he was well networked and he could also serve as a good advisor to me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I went through a gap analysis, as I said, and I identified the right person. It was all meritocracy based. Today, we look at meritocracy, but we also look at everything else. And as we all know, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, all that matters. And I really wanted to fill the board with a woman, but I just was not able to, given where the company was at the time, given what I needed to do vis-a-vis a a follow-on financing, um, identify the right woman to fill the role. So I filled the role with the right person. That's the most important thing is filling the right role, filling the role with the right person. And so um, to come back to the point of who the, who the board was, it was a couple of investors, an independent, and then I identified a second independent who was well, um, well ensconced, established in the microbiome space, which, which was an adjacency we were looking at. And so we were thinking fast and forward, possible strategy expansion into that space. And so we brought someone on. But I will say that what I was advised at the get-go from by my, my part-time CFO was get your independence in as soon as you can, because you really want to avoid the scenario, the situation where your board is just investor run. Again, it's not a bad thing, but it, it sort of doesn't give you as a CEO the biggest spread of opportunity to build and expand your company. So that's uh, ultimately how we built the board is just, you know, through networking, but then identifying the gaps and then filling those gaps. Yeah, that, that's great. That's really great uh, advice too. There's um, there's a really interesting question that just showed up also coming back to um, the de-risking uh, questions that you were being asked quite a lot that you mentioned. And can you maybe talk a little bit about how can you uh, kind of steer these into a more positive way? Or was that your strategy? Do you simply had a really good de-risking strategy or did you also pivot? And uh, actually th- that's what a lot of good interviewers uh, or good people who answer interviews, politicians for instance, uh, do. They have this story and uh, they answer part of the question but then they steer it into another direction. Uh, Was that a strategy that you were using? That's exactly what we did, Stephanie. I mean, at the end of the day, you can't diminish or minimize a question that someone asks you, especially an investor. I mean, we were, you know, we're all colleagues and professionals and we all have to have respect for each other. So you start off by saying, what an excellent point, what an excellent question. And let me address how I'm going to de-risk this or how this particular aspect of the company is going to be de-risked. But let me also highlight that the strategy also involves the growth of the company. This is really, these are the areas that we plan on adding or altering or expanding into. And that's another mechanism by which we de-risk A, B, and C. So you're addressing the question head on, but you're also highlighting to them that you offer them more than just being a Band-Aid to problem X, Y, or Z, right? That you're actually... Now you're creating kind of the armamentoire, if you will, of possible strategies to mitigate future risks, but that involves a growth approach. And so that's how we tackled it. And you've got to just, you know, smile and be respectful because it's mutual respect, you know, in, in between the people in the room. Um, and that's how you you really you turn it around to the to the point made in the in the chat is is right on. You know, you basically you have a good portfolio strategy and you talk about how you're going to turn it around and focus on the market opportunity. And it's exactly what we did because we were asked all the time. In fact, we were told you shouldn't be in antibiotics. Why are you in the space? How are you going to manage this? And so we said, well, this is what the unmet need is. And this is how our product strategy is going to accommodate the unmet need. But we realize that we are going to have to make a huge dent in reimbursement and commercial market changes. And here's what we're doing to address that. And so it, it showed them that, A, we knew what we were talking about, that we had all the KOLs and the advisors and experts around us, and we weren't going into this blind, thinking that, oh, everything was just going to be a, a walk in the park. 
And with all of that, you definitely had your share of uh, success, but also you described some difficult moments. Talk to us a little bit about setting the vision and sharing that with your employees or even developing that vision together and having everybody really buy in and live that vision. Yeah, so, you know, I think that that's, that's um, I mean, that that's sort of, you know, company building 101, right? You know, you set the vision and you build it together, but it was even more pronounced um, in our situation because we were charting some really challenging strategies or territories with respect to the science and the um, the market in particular. I remember having a conversation with um, the gentleman who became my CSO. He I, he joined as an advisor to me or as a, as a consultant, as a science consultant. And he was really down on antibiotics, although he was a pure expert in the space and as a chemist really knew exactly where to tweak the molecules and how best to develop and knew all the challenges with antibiotic development. He was a naysayer with respect to the antibiotic space overall. And after talking to him about what we felt we could do with the technology and what I saw the promise, I set the vision, I kind of put this vision statement out to him. He was a convert. I mean, he said, oh, my goodness, this is so true. And I, I want to be part of this. So I think part of it is, you know, it's like making that Kool-Aid and drinking it, but making sure that there's some natural ingredients in that Kool-Aid. So you're not just drinking, you know, um, lies, if you will, or spewing lies, but rather that there's some truth to what you're saying. But at the end of the day, we're all out selling a vision, right? We're all, we're, we're most of us, I would, I would posit, and I don't know everyone in the audience, most of us are probably early to mid-stage, um, uh, you know, product development people. None of us have commercial markets. None of us have something tangible we're actually putting into patients. Ultimately, that's the dream. That's the goal. That's the vision. So um, I think, you know, if we don't have that, I don't think any of us would be doing what we're doing because it is such a long and arduous and uphill battle and road. And so you've got to have um, a passion, more importantly, and a vision and a passion to achieve that vision. So um, really, a lot of it kind of comes back to that storytelling. You know, you you tell the story, you see how people react, you listen to the, the points they poke holes in, such as what my CSO did, and then you, you debate that with them such that they sort of see the light. And to the extent you need to pivot the story to accommodate some of the concerns they've highlighted, because again, we don't want to be telling mistruths or alternate truths. We want to really be telling the right story. You accommodate that in your vision. And so that's how I ended up getting the team together and, and building the group and, um, you know, very, very passionate group. And I, I do want to just address, there was a question you had, which I probably missed over a difficult board moment, um, kind of comes back to the vision and the selling of the vision. Again, the board was often also quite, I wouldn't say risk averse because they put money in us and most of them were investors, but they really challenged us and had us on our toes at all times in a good way to, to remind ourselves and to remind them as to why we were doing this. And so I would not call that a difficult moment. I would call it challenging because I felt every time we had a board meeting, I had to almost reset the story for them. I had to remind them of why we were doing what we were doing and then continue to tell them what we had done since we last met. And um, so that was sort of, again, that I think that's just good storytelling in general, whenever you're meeting with investors. And if nothing else, it prepared me and the team for pitching to investors because investors, they meet with hundreds of people in hundreds of company in any given days, in any given day. And so part of what you have to do as a senior executive is just to get, get out in front of them and within a minute, just remind them of why you're doing what you're doing and who you are, and then talk about the progress you've made since you last met with them. That's another great point. And you also touched on uh, this, this topic of authenticity and uh, being, being a female CEO, um, how were you supported in this by some mentors and supporters? You mentioned uh, that this was very important for you and that you are also a great mentor and supporter of, of women. If you could touch on that, that would also be wonderful. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I will say that, um, as I said earlier, I've, I'm only just still learning the power of networks and I'm starting to learn or continuing to learn, I should say, how to best leverage networks. I, I will kind of go, you know, just say that finding mentors 
has, um, it takes effort. It takes effort. Um, you know, there are some people who say you don't find mentors, they find you. And that may be well and good. And those I would argue are the lucky ones. Um, I had to go seek people to specifically with the Asani Biotics Initiative that we co-founded and, and that I ran. I had to talk to people and identify people who understood the story and appreciated enough that they were willing to step in and support me on, on the journey and on the path. Um, I would also say that um, it was easier to find men who were mentors than women. I have my views on why that might be, and I'd love to get the audience's views on why that might be, because I don't know, maybe some of you are experiencing that or have experienced it. But I um, I find I found a lot of times, and I, I, you know, coming back to the investors as well, I found that a lot of the women investors were harder on me than the men investors were, than the male investors were. Uh, similarly, I found that finding mentors who were women um, in who I, you know, from whom I wanted some specific guidance and expertise vis-a-vis -vis the antibiotic space and navigating that world were a little bit more down on it and possibly because they had been through the ringer with antibiotics as an industry or as a subject matter and had not seen success. And so maybe they were trying to dissuade me and us as a team from really going down that path. Um, but I will say just in general terms, it's up to us to go seek mentors. It's up to us to go seek allies and create ally allyship. And I don't think we as, as, as a group of people do that enough. I think we can, you know, sort of the oft used term, we can lift ourselves higher, even if we were to do that. And then finally, I will say that those CEOs who are truly successful, and if we come back to the industry definition of success, which is raising money and seeing an exit, et cetera, et cetera, I would posit that those CEOs are successful because they have had sponsors. And so it's sort of a three-pronged sort of perspective, right? There's mentors, there's allies, and there's sponsors. And it's in our best interest to have access to all three. I think we have more control who can mentor us and who we can be allies with or who, who can be allies with us. I think we have less control over who can sponsor us, but it's still, I would say, in our wheelhouse to go and seek people who possibly can be sponsors for us. And how you get that is by demonstrating to them what you can do, how you can do it, that you are professional, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, much like others, um, other CEOs and other executives, you know, went through the process of trying to identify people who would fit in each of those categories. And the reality is not everyone said yes. In fact, most people said no, partly because they were busy or partly because they didn't believe in the story. But again, coming back to what I said earlier, for me, no was not no, but rather not now. So I went back to them later after I had a different story or I had, you know, more mile, you know, more milestones under the belt in terms of an advanced deck, so to speak, to share with them. Um, and so I think, you know, perseverance and persistence goes a long way. Being authentic to who you are as a person and standing by your values, I think, you know, goes a long way. And knowing that at the end of the day, um, really, I, th I really strongly believe, and I'd love people's perspectives as well, that if you don't have a sponsor, you're making it that much more difficult for yourself. And the way you get sponsors is to kind of identify the mentors and the allies. And then I think you create sponsors out of those two networks. I don't know if that addresses the question, Stephanie. No, definitely. But yeah, to the to the audience also, if there's, if there's more, um, yeah, more questions from you, but also answers to Ramani's questions, please speak up. But uh, in the meantime, maybe uh, very quickly, you, you mentioned also um, the whole quote-unquote cast of characters, so uh, sponsors, mentors, uh, the board members, uh, your, your team members. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, advisors, how you were selecting advisors? And yeah. um, there was also a very specific question, what would be typical for a startup with, with respect to compensation for advisors versus board members, a few details on that. Yeah, so advisors, you know, I, I see advisors as, um, having answers to some very specific questions we have. 
both on the strategy as well as on the tactical side. They're they're less they're they're typically less engaged and involved in the growth of the company, you know, where the company goes from today through the next three, four years, versus focused on where the company is today. Um, and so with respect to our advisors, we had a whole group of advisors, clinical, commercial, um, talks, et cetera. And what we were doing was really planning for each of the of the progress through of our of our programs, our, our pipeline through each of the stages of development. And so we being a small company, we decided we weren't going to hire too many people as full-time individuals, but rather leverage the dollars we had to bring in experts and consultants when we needed them. And so we had maybe three or four strong advisors, and by strong I mean um, you know, long-term advisors that stayed with us through the the um, lifetime of the company, and who had been in the antibiotic space, and who knew some of the ins and outs of of some of the prior successes of products on the market, and some of the failures of other products on the market, uh, other products that never made it to the market. So we wanted their experience, but we also had some people who were very specific in in their domain expertise with respect to knowing what kind of talk studies to do, or how best to design a non-inferiority or superiority trial in antibiotics understanding the challenges. And so we brought those on as very specific advisors to engage with us in within a defined time frame to support us on, on pipeline advancement. Um, on the point of, um, you know, we certainly had a scientific advisory board and those people were involved in thinking about the broader science application of the technology we were using to discover antibiotics and think about the microbiome and other possible avenues for science expansion. On the point of... Um, compensation, it kind of ranges. I mean, you can certainly think about equity for advisors. We typically didn't. Um, you know, we were, board got equity, the board got cash. Uh, typically advisors, scientific advisors, we had co-founders of science that scientific advisors, so they got equity as well. But typically, we, when we whenever we brought an advisor on, it was a cash-based compensation. And it was very rarely even a retainer. It was almost for uh, services rendered uh, versus um, having a board, which is quite quite involved, quite engaged, and that much more wedded to the company. And so there was an equity component there. There were probably a couple of advisors who we were quite deeply engaging um, or who were deeply engaged with us. And so we felt that equity was a reasonable compensation, but it really ranges. The industry is, um, is pretty widespread in how they compensate this, this group of people. Great, thank you for answering this question. Also, there came up uh, another really, really nice one, uh, which could yeah, almost be um, a, a very nice uh, closure and summary. Um, somebody, Lydia actually asked, what is your definition of success having been a CEO? Yep, I'm really glad you asked that question because I think about that a lot. And um, it goes back to, so there is that again, that box checking exercise, right? And so there are some external boxes or boxes that are set by the industry that we were able to check. So by that definition, yes, I was successful. The company was successful. But if I kind of sit at home and look at myself and think about success for myself, I actually have a little note on my desk here. Um, and this goes to checking my own box. And so how I define success is something that I am proud of. And so if I have done something that I can truly be proud of, then I consider that a success. I consider that a win. And so in founding Xbiotics, in taking the role as a CEO and president and bringing the team together in raising the funding in advancing the pipeline in dealing with all the challenges that go um, along with building a company in the antibiotic space, which is, as I said, already challenged with its own um, challenges. Um, you know, we did what we set out to do. And so there was a big check mark there for all of us, frankly, because we are really proud as a team of what we did. So on that note, you know, Lydia, I would say that that was my definition of success. Now, it doesn't necessarily check the box, so to speak, for certain investors and you know for follow-on funding, et cetera, et cetera. You do still have to go through the okay, have I advanced the pipeline by X amount? You know, do I have these types of programs, et cetera? There, there's still that industry checkbox you need to check. But all that aside, putting the hard issues aside, um, you know, when you're kind of sitting at home and you're thinking, reflecting on your day. Um, you know, if I have done a thing or two or three that I'm proud of that day, then I've been successful that day. 
might be a cop out answer, but I don't think it is. I think it's a little bit more of an introspective answer. No, and I think it it, it is very authentic. Uh, you know, connected to what you mentioned before. You mentioned that it's really important to always give your best and be authentic to yourself and really be the best prepared. And in a way that also takes off a, a lot of the the burden, uh, you know, of self doubt. So I really like that answer. Any any more or last questions from anybody in the audience? Here's your chance. In the meantime, maybe Ramani, you can you can speak uh, a little bit more about the topic that that really sort of unifies us. How what what we can what you think what we can do as women really to support each other to be better supporters and mentors with each other, uh, really no matter what we do. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is something we all think about a lot. Um, you know, I think we have to stop thinking, frankly, that there can be only one alpha female or queen bee, right? We're all queen bees here, if you will, or we're all worker bees, however you look at it. We're all kind of in this together. Um, we all matter and allyship and sponsorship go a long way. So one of the things I like to do, and I, I spend quite a bit of time, in fact, some of my colleagues have uh, said that I should add the term um, mentor capital to my LinkedIn page, which I thought was so funny <laughs> because I, I spend time, uh, <laughs> I spend, or mentor capitalist, um, I spend time talking to a lot of people, talking to a lot of women in particular who are thinking about where they want to go, where they should go. And I learn a lot from them, probably just as much as they learn from uh, talking to me. Um, you know, I think celebrating each other's successes is something we don't do enough of. And by success, I don't mean, you know, sort of do the, the round thing on, on Zoom, which a lot of people do, but rather truly authentically support each other, whether it be sponsoring each other on LinkedIn or sponsoring each other in conversations that you're having offline. If a recruiter calls you and something is not right as an opportunity for you, mention three or four other women's names who you think might be interested. That goes a long way. And I don't think we do enough of that. Um, you know, I think the notion of that crab mentality, if I can't have it, that you can't either. I think we just have to throw that out with, you know, the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, on that one. I think it's, I think we've, we've, we've done, you know, come a long way with, with doing away with that. But I think, I think it's just kind of now is the time to give back. And I think, you know, with COVID and with Black Lives Matter and with DEI initiatives everywhere, if, if we're not all sort of standing behind each other and helping each other up, then we're just not doing this group of people, um, women, that is, justice. And so I think that's what we can, you know, really um, do to just help ourselves, you know, being empathetic, not just sympathetic, because sympathy only goes a certain way. Empathy really means you understand what the, the shoes that someone's walking in. And I think we all have it in us because we're, we're, that's where we differ from men. I think we are a little more empathetic and I think we can use that to our advantage. Um, and I, I would just say, you know, if we as a group could continue to support the notion that health equity matters in everything we do, and continue to amplify that message. Um, I think we can just bring the industry, you know, that much more together and, to, and as, you know, be comprehensive in, in what we do overall. Thank you, Ramani. This, this was really a, a wonderful hour and I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking for uh, the entire audience. Thank you so much for sharing all your insights with us from how to build a company, how to um, raise funds, how to uh, build a board, um, how to uh, also recruit advisors, but also sharing your own, your own values, a lot of uh, self-awareness, a lot of uh, introspection and um, how to really always do your best and be authentic to yourself, but also to support others and uh, first give and uh, also contribute uh, to, the, to the greater good. Really, really from the bottom of my heart, a big, big thank you to you. Thank, thank you, you Stephanie and Romani. Oh, thank you everyone. Really nice to see a lot of you from before and meet new people. So thanks again, everyone.